So um, here on the right is uh, Toronto. That's where I live right now. It's not snowing, but you can see why I'm very happy to be here in Barcelona with you. <laughs> um, your city is beautiful, and uh, this is my third time here, and I absolutely love it. Fantastic people and great sights and great food. And as I found out last night, great gin. Um, <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me if uh, my presentation is not quite as polished as I would like it to be. I, I had a giant amount of gin. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so, okay. Uh, all right. So um, I consider myself extremely lucky to be working in the game industry, which is an industry that I am so passionate about. And I've decided today to share with you um, two main areas of technological development that I think are going to lead to major new innovations in the game industry and things that I'm really excited about. So it's a bunch of my thinking about where we're going in the future and just sharing my thoughts on what I'm excited about. Now, the industry has continued to evolve constantly. Um, since I was born, uh, games have gone from this, you know, things that required very special hardware and could only be played in the arcade, to Tekken, uh, one of my first favorite games that I was able to play at my home console, to Resident Evil, uh, one of my favorite games that, you know, showed to me that you could really elicit strong emotions, um, to now Assassin's Creed Unity and Assassin's Creed in general, which I think we've been successful in fully immersing people in a historical time period and in a totally different environment. And that's really what attracted me to the game industry, is the fact that we haven't found a single recipe yet for what a game is. We're constantly challenged by new platforms and new technology, uh, advances in networks, advances in the way people uh, can interact and, and the way people consume entertainment. And as game developers, we're constantly challenged to come up with something new that will surprise players and uh, that will change the way that we play games. And that's what's incredibly exciting to me, is this concept that you have to always keep up and figure out what a game is, and that there's always opportunities for that to evolve. Um, when I grew up, I was watching uh, Star Trek, and I was a pretty nerdy kid. Um, and you know, seeing things like the holodeck made me believe that one day games would be even more immersive than the holodeck. And reading science fiction books, uh, like Ender's Game and Diamond Age also made me believe that one day games would be even more meaningful than uh, recent, a recent game Folded has been able to be. And that's what I truly believe. Um, and that's why I continue to be really excited to be in the game industry. Another reason <laughs> I got into the game industry, this is me when I was three, uh, was I was a bit of a strange kid. Um, <laughs> I spent according to my mother, a lot of time lying on the ground and staring up at the sky and not saying anything, which is very weird for a toddler. So um, she liked to tell a story that one day she finally came over and asked me what I was doing. And what I said to her is, where do cows come from, mommy? And <laughs> so she looked at me and she thought I was asking a question about the birds and the bees. So she said, well, you know, there's the mommy cow and there's the daddy cow. And um, so I interrupted her and I said, no, no, mommy, where do cows come from? Where do chickens come from? Where does it all end? Where does it all begin? And so that's when she says that she knew she was in trouble and I was going to be a difficult child. Um, but she decided, to, uh, she decided to treat my question uh, seriously, even though I was only three. And she, so she decided to explain to me different creation myths and where humans came from. And so she explained you know, that some people believe in Adam and Eve. And, then she explained that uh, some people believe in Darwinian evolution and that we're descendants from monkeys, and that other people believe that the Earth was colonized by aliens. And, um, <laughs> what, you're laughing? That's what I believe. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> so apparently I listened uh, very carefully to these explanations, and at the end I said, Mommy, those all just sound like stories to me. And so, you know, I got into the game industry because I am a very strange kid. Uh, and have always been strange, and I have a lot of questions, and I honestly do believe that games can help us answer some of those questions.
But enough about the philosophical side. Um, I also want to give you guys some data because we are in the age of data and it's always nice to have some cold, hard facts. So here's some numbers that show how the games industry has evolved. Um, and what you can see is that all of the major innovation and changes in the game industry have come along with ma major innovations in platforms. And when I say major innovations in platforms, I don't just mean new consoles. I mean actual changes in technology that change the way that we play. Uh, so you can see the evolution from dice games to card games that created a huge explosion. Uh, the explosion in arcade games going to home console. And obviously the most recent explosion uh, thanks to mobile games and social and the democratization of online. And those have really propelled the industry forward, not only in terms of revenue generation for the industry, um, but also in terms of the number of people who play games. And you know the fact that now games aren't just for a small group of nerds, but everyone plays games. It's part of pop culture. Um, and also, you know, these changes in platforms is what has propelled the medium forward, I think, also, and enabled us to continue to transform what games are. So as we mentioned, um, you know, there is the big evolution, the most recent one that went from social games to mobile. Um, I think I'm getting a bit too much feedback here. Maybe is it a bit loud? Can we turn it down a bit? No? Seems fine. Okay. Um, so in terms of mobile, I mean, it has been a big change in terms of attracting more people to games and having more people playing. But in my opinion, on the creative standpoint, uh, there hasn't been such a huge creative boom uh, that I personally am so excited about. I think what passes for innovation is the recycling of 40-year-old game designs with um, often, unfortunately, real-world gambling and money stuck on top of it. But I do feel like there's hope and that we're on the verge of some major breakthroughs. Um, in terms of what we're going to see. And so today I'm going to talk about some technologies that I think will lead to two major new forms of gaming that are worth thinking about. All right. Um, so here's another chart. This is the kind of chart that makes business people happy. It shows this hockey stick that everyone goes, okay, great, we're going to make a lot of money. Um, but I think <laughs> it's, also, it's also interesting to show that, uh, that some of the new tech or one of the new major tech innovations that uh, I think is going to be exciting and important for games. And that's the proliferation of cheap sensors in the form of wearable tech and the Internet of Things. So you can see that smartphones continues to have big growth and has had the growth that we already know about. Um, but then if you look at the Internet of Things and wearables, you see that that kind of proliferation and growth is expected to be exponential uh, from the analyst's perspective. Um, so for me personally, you know, I'm still the kind of gamer who by far prefers sitting at a console um, and that's the kind of game experience that I like to have. But the truth of mat the matter is, is that the <laughs> these days, maybe a bunch of the mics are on at once, no? Uh, anyways, um, so I think actually what's happening these days is that I'm spending a lot more time on mobile games than I actually am in the home console. And I think that the reality is, is that the form factor is much more adapted to uh, the actual way of life of today and the reality of the way people spend their time. So the phone is always in my pocket. I can always play when I have five minutes free in between other things. And to me, that's the real key to the mobile success that we've seen. The fact that it's always accessible and that's adapted to people's reality of a uh, real way of life. And so I think with these um, new proliferation of sensors into wearables and the Internet of Things, what you're going to see is that extension um, and availability of mobile games becoming even more integrated into our everyday lives and even more accessible and even more seamlessly integrated into the way we live. And I think, you know, this is what I'm calling, it's going to give birth to what I'm calling ambient games. And uh, for those of you who think maybe I'm crazy and don't know what I'm talking about right now, um, there's actually already early examples of what I would call ambient games that have over 10 million people playing today. So I'm going to give you some examples of what I'm talking about. 
Um, but first, I want to talk about the actual wearables. So there's a database right now uh, called Vendrico um, that has, is currently tracking over 233 different wearable devices. And then if you add that to the Internet of Things, there's currently thousands of these devices out there and available for purchase. If you look at that hockey stick chart that I showed before, um, analysts are expecting that there's going to be millions of these things within four years. And um, not so long ago, there was also a tech breakthrough um, when the US government removed selective availability from um, basically uh, the capacity to track GPS, which unlocked a whole new type of gaming. Um, and it also, uh, it basically is a tech that was preventing people from getting precise GPS tracking on things and people. And this selective availability was removed uh, in May of 2000. And from that, there was a birth of a new type of game called geocaching. And more recently, I think what's interesting is the puzzle-based geocaching. So there are currently 6 million geocachers around the world. And for those of you who don't know about geocaching, it's kind of a real world treasure hunting. Um, and in the last 14 years, it's evolved to integrate cryptology, um, strange, you know, unused languages, narrative, and more recently, augmented reality. Um, an interesting example of this, actually, there's a few of them out there, so if you want to look them up, there's uh, Circata 3301, uh, which is an extension of this kind of thing. Uh, there's Endgame, which is recently being talked about, but I'm going to talk about Ingress, which is um, a game that was developed by Google's Niantic Labs. And um, it's a game that's played out in the real world, and uh, it integrates some of the kind of gameplay mechanics that you could maybe think of as, you know, hacking that you would see in a watchdog's uh, mixed with a narrative layer that has some J.J. Abrams-like conspiracy that you might find in the show Fringe. But basically, it divides up players into two different factions that battle <coughs> over control of real-world landmarks. And there are millions of people playing uh, this game now. And the levels of engagement are actually quite surprising. So the community is really, really engaged. And what I find interesting is it's also um, destroying one myth about gamers that we just are anti-social nerds who want to stay at home in our basement <laughs> and not talk to anyone. So this is actually getting you know, millions of gamers out there playing in the real world and uh, talking together. Um, and I, th I think what's, <laughs> what's cool about this is that it's a first step that proves to me that we're not so far off from creating an MMO in the real world. So why not extend this instead of having two factions, having classes and cooperative play in the real world? And I think you know, even a very basic thing that people like to do in World of Warcraft, which is fishing, becomes a lot more fun if you're doing it around you know, a fountain, for example, which you have a lot of beautiful ones here in Barcelona. You could be using your Fitbit to track throwing the lure and your Google Glass. Um, although I have to admit, before I would play that game myself, Google has got <laughs> um, so a lot of the things going on, in the, so here are some of the examples of the fitness-based wearables that are out there. I actually own every single one of these, not because I'm particularly fit, but because, um, or I'm not actually using them to get very fit, but I'm just very interested in the applications for games, so I've been experimenting with them a lot. Um, but currently, one of the apps, I guess, you know, sort of, or what the apps amount to is kind of like, you know, track, like RunKeeper tracks your route that you took when you did a run. Um, it's tied into social networks, so you publish to friends that you did a run. And you basically get some very light, I guess, gameplay badges, uh, gameplay awards in the form of badges that say you did the fastest run or things like that that your friends can see. Um, but I can personally tell you that I, as a gamer, would be much more motivated to go out and do my runs if running around my neighborhood helped build up my walls in Clash of Clans or had some other gameplay benefit. So I think that we're on the verge of really unlocking the real potential of these things. Um, a professional football player named Chris Cluey recently gave a talk at TED, and he was talking about how augmented reality is going to chase, uh, change the face of professional football. Uh, so talking about you know the real time. Uh, orders coming in from the coach, 
uh, AR display on your helmet, getting the plays in real time and all of that stuff. And I do think that's exciting. But to me, it's far more interesting to think of the consumer application of these cheap sensors going on regular basketballs or regular hoops and all of a sudden transforming the game of pickup that you have with your friends in the local park or intramural uh, sports for kids at school. And all of a sudden, the concept of ultimate team uh, for those of you who play that on FIFA or my team, you know, actually being able to be played on top of your real stats with your friends and your real team. Another thing that uh, ambient gaming is going to bring is a continuing blurring of the lines between artificial intelligence and real people. Um, this is something that's been going on in games for a long time. I think with Burnout is probably the first place that we saw the drive avatars. <laughs> Uh, come to be, and there is also, you know, obviously that in, in uh, Forza, where you know the artificial intelligence isn't just the AI programmed by your uh, by programmers, but it's actually you know your friends' driving style that creates the AI, and it's integrated into your game so that you can be racing against your friends even if you're not there. Those kinds of concepts also exist in games like Dark Souls, where your friends impact your games, and that's being used to drive AI. One thing that you guys might not be aware of is that those kinds of blurring the lines of AI and your friend's behavior that's happening in games is also actually happening in real social networks. So currently, there are millions of AI bots, Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, liking things, making comments, and uh, hecking these bots. There are still some of these, these bots that are so good at impersonating humans that you got them already. So if you want to learn more about that, um, you can look into Pacific, um, which is uh, a research division that's doing a lot of research into this field. But it's actually pretty interesting how the lines are being blurred, not only in games between artificial intelligence and real multiplayer games, but also how, in my opinion, this is going to continue to transform social networks and what I'm calling ambient games. So why are people going to play these games? I think, <laughs> I, you know, I mentioned before there's the integration into the way that we actually live these days the form factor of mobile, the fact that it's always with you and that it's adapted to your life, I think that's going to be even more the case with the Internet of Things and wearables. The reality is that integration into your real world life is going to continue to get more seamless and more adapted as these devices become smaller um, and more transparent and just integrated into the world in which we live. I also um, believe that there is a fundamental shift that's been happening in the last few years in the way that people absorb information, um, and also the way people want to um, absorb content and be entertained. So I think we've gone from a mode um, in the world where we used to have undivided attention. I mean, even you can picture those, those images of kids in the 50s or whole families in the 50s that would gather around the radio and just listen to the radio and everyone was quiet. <laughs> and that's certainly not the case anymore. I mean, right now, you know, you'll be watching TV, you'll be on Twitter at the same time, you'll be talking to a friend on the phone, and it's no problem. All of that is happening at once. And so we've gone from a world of undivided attention to a world of multitasking to a world of continuous partial attention. And play has always been a way to practice real world skills. And I actually think that continuous partial attention is a real world skill that's going to be very important for the future. I think that in order to maximize our time that we have here on Earth, we're trying to fill every spare moment that we have with productive output or also turn the mundane into the entertaining. And that's the power that we have currently in mobile games um, that I think is going to be even more true with this next phase. And so, in summary for this point, um, the world is becoming an even more connected and densely and tightly integrated place where all objects are becoming self-aware and communica communicative. And not only has it become normal during our you know, recent years to constantly at all times have access to all human knowledge. It's also normal now to be const in constant communication with everyone we know. And I think very soon, we're also going to be in constant communication with everything in our environment. And I think we can make that environment playable. So now for the second thing I'm excited about. Um, so the, the second big group of technical advancement that I'm excited about, and I, I'm not just calling it one thing, is virtual reality. But even more importantly than the 
um, display technology that virtual reality is. To me, it's the input technology that it implies and that's going to have to come with it. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried VR so far. Can you put up your hands? Okay, good portion. Um, so I think that you know our current control scheme is already at its limits. I think that um, traditional console controllers is what's keeping a lot of the mass market people from enjoying uh, games. Controls have gotten too complicated. And it's even more the case when you're wearing VR headset on your head that the current controls just don't work. And so along with this technology, there's going to be a whole group of advancements in input technology that I'm grouping together with VR and that I find incredibly exciting. So here's a few examples of it. Um, down at the bottom, there's rings. Those are uh, pieces of jewelry that can actually sense your input and where you're pointing and can be used as control devices. Um, we have the Thalmic Labs uh, wrist monitor. This one uh, you wear on your wrist and it, it senses your tendons. And I don't have a video of it here, but it's, there's a really great um, demo of controlling a drone by just moving your hand like this in a sensitive way and you can fly the drone around so that's pretty cool also there's the glove of course as gamers we've seen millions of gloves but maybe they're going to get good now and uh you know 2d 2d treadmills and there's a whole bunch of things and in fact there's even some really exciting advancements in terms of being able to re read uh, the synaptic pulses from your brain, so actually translating your thoughts into controls. And if you think this sounds like science fiction, it does, but I'm going to show you, um, if for those of you who have been watching the World Cup, I suspect there's some soccer fans in the audience here, um, <laughs> at the start of the opening ceremony, um, a paralyzed man was able to walk out and kick the uh, first ball by using um, just his thoughts to control a machine that enabled him to walk and kick. And here's some consumer grade versions of these kinds of head devices that allow you to control things with your thoughts. So I'll play that video for you. Today's surprise was born here in a Brazilian science lab where they're teaching the paralyzed to walk again. One of their patients will step forward at today's opening ceremony and kick the first ball. The patient's in control of what he wants to achieve and the machine is doing what is needed mechanically. The chief scientist explains the patient's brain sends signals to a computerized suit that moves his legs. This will be a jaw-dropping moment. I hope so before a global audience. Yeah, our jaws have dropped many times in this laboratory. You know, the first time the first patient walked here was one of the greatest moments of our lives. So that's interesting. Um, if you got, if you're interested in finding out more, there's actually a few years ago, there was already someone who managed to play a game of pinball using their thoughts. Uh, so it's something that's already out there and been experimented with. And so I think that this, um, you know, the big investment by Facebook and VR and the push that it's really here is not only going to be mean advancements in VR, which you know, have obvious impacts in the game industry, but also advancements in input and how we control games. And I find that that's super, super exciting. And I actually have uh, my own kind of game idea that I'm really excited to do. Uh, I would love to be able to recreate uh, parkour, the kind of thing that you have in Assassin's Creed, but in a zero G space environment. So moving throughout space in zero G and really experience seeing the world from above and navigating um, around different uh, objects in space or around a space station and essentially living out kind of what an astronaut like Chris Hatfield describes in his TED talk um, and to fun. Um, and <laughs> I think if we succeed in doing something like has a much cheaper and safer alternative, <laughs> so he might be not happy with that game. <laughs> Um, the other thing I'm excited about, <laughs> you guys probably watch Game of Thrones, I guess. This is a good episode. Um, the, the, the other thing I'm really excited about is that, you, obviously, virtual reality implies 
a very precise representation of 3D play space. And it also implies you know, a very precise representation of players in that space. And as a big fighting game fan, I hopefully, th I hopefully think that this will lead to finally a good experience of melee combat in games. Um, I also think it's going to lead to, well, actually, Eve Valkyrie has a really interesting demo of uh, 3D space combat, and I think that that's going to be a really interesting and different experience. Um, and I couldn't resist embedding a reference uh, to Star Trek where uh, Spock tells Kirk that Khan is having a hard time navigating uh, his spaceships because he's still thinking in 2D space. So I'm going to play that for you. You followed me this far. From where? He's intelligent, but not experienced. His pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. <laughs> you just can't get that kind of smile, can you? <laughs> So why do we care about VR? I mean, I, I really do believe that VR and all of this new display advancement is going to m enable us to deliver whole new types of gaming experience and experience and share new types of things. But I also think it has benefits on a cognitive level, as uh, Spock implied there. Um, we've long used 2D maps as our basic form of representation, uh, as a way to communicate things that we couldn't normally see on our own. So if you look at this map of Spain, superimposed on it, you can see the roads, you can see the cities, you can see population, you can see um, you know, the use of the land. And all of these things are represented quite well in a 2D space. And what you have, you know, we're, we already are able to represent so many more dimensions of data on a simple 2D map. I, I like to imagine 3D will enable us to imagine and comprehend and share. And so potentially even greater uh, spaces beyond 3D. And the credit my friend Doug Church with is what if you could do SketchUp uh, in VR as a shared experience with friends, which is pretty cool. And then also just thinking of a game like Migakure um, in VR is also making my brain melt. <laughs> so, in summary, um, there are a lot of really exciting things going on, and I think we're on the cusp of major innovation in different areas in games. Um, ultimately, I think this combination of sensors and proliferation of sensors are making the collective unconscious actually material and real. Um, it means that all of these connections that we have as humans are actually becoming a very real thing. Um, and the hive mind is actually becoming a real thing. I think when you add that to VR, um, you get the exponential ways to understand uh, the world in which we live. And if you add games to that, it's a, few, it's a truly new way to comprehend and share those concepts. So um, as another illustration of the collective unconscious, I saw yesterday that Randomly, Tim Schafer also decided to reference Carl Jung, so that's a good example of it being a real thing. Uh, Carl Jung, I don't know if you guys know, is a gamer, clearly, um, but he had this quote that I think applies to my talk. I'll let you read it. Um, and so I'd like to leave you with that, and also this. <laughs> and um, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, I know that this was a dense talk, but hopefully, you <laughs> uh, hopefully it was coherent, despite the gin. And um, if you have any questions or, oh, that didn't show up properly, but um, if you have any questions or want to talk to me about these ideas or any others, I'm also on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is IBJ, and I discuss these and other um, random thoughts that you might have. So thank you very much.